Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is JCK from the YouTube channel Quantum Truths JCK. And this is my reading of Anastasia, book one of the Ringing Cedars series. You may have heard of the Ringing Cedars of Russia many times, and they are a series of very incredible books that must be read at least once in your lifetime. Well, I'm offering you today a reading of the first book, Anastasia. And this book was written by a Russian man named Vladimir Megre. And the series of books are available out there if you look for them, uh, but they are becoming harder to find. So I thought I would read this to you all so that you could have an audiobook version and listen to this in chapters uh, at your own leisure. So I will be time stamping this video so that if you have to come back here, you can skip this part and go straight into the book. And I will be reading the various chapters, including the translator's uh, preface and the intro. So this rendition of the book is the original version, the original translation by John Woodsworth. Uh, this is a later translation here. And it's got a slightly different feel to it. Most people prefer these books here. Okay. So this is Anastasia, book one of the Ringing Cedars series. So we will begin with the start of the book. I exist for those for whom I exist, Anastasia. Anastasia herself has stated that this book written about her consists of words and phrases in combinations which have a beneficial effect on the reader. This has been attested by the letters received to date from thousands of readers all over the world. If you wish to gain all full an appreciation as possible of the ideas, thoughts and images set forth here, as well as experience the benefits that come with this appreciation, we recommend you find a quiet place for your reading where there is the least possible interference from artificial noise, motor traffic, radio, TV, household appliances, etc. Natural sounds, on the other hand, the singing of birds, for example, or the patter of rain, or the rustle of leaves on the nearby trees may be a welcome accompaniment to the reading process. Translator's Preface When I opened my online Slavic Languages Bulletin one day in early September 2004 and first learned about the book in the Ringing Cedar series that was seeking a translator in English, Little did I realize the kind of literature adventure that was awaiting me. But as I became acquainted with the details of Vladimir Megre's fascinating work, I read through the first three books in the series from beginning the, from beginning the actual translation. It gradually dawned on me that much of my previous translation experience, especially in poetry, from Pushkin to Anna Akhmatova, to modern bards and poetic prose, as with the stories of contemporary Russian writer Mikhail Sadovsky, not to mention my religious background, emphasizing man's unique status as the image and likeness of the creator, had been preparing me specifically for this particular task. Megre's work was simply the next logical step. It seemed, in the progression of my career, Indeed, I found myself taking to it, not only with the enthusiasm that comes with the prospect of facing a new professional challenge, but even more with the thought of feeling very much at home in this new literary environment. Some of my friends and colleagues have asked, what kind of book are you translating? No doubt wondering whether they could look forward to a, reading a novel, a documentary account, an inspirational ex exegesis, 
on the meaning of life, or even a volume of poetry. But even after completing the translation of Anastasia, I still do not have a definitive answer to give them. In fact, I am still asking myself the same question. My initial response was a crude summary of a gut impression. I would tell them, think of Star Trek meets the Bible. My feelings about the book, however, go far beyond this primitive attempt at jocularity. Of the four disparate genres mentioned above, I would have to say Anastasia has elements of all four and then some. First, the book reads like a novel. That is to say, it tells a first-person story in a most entertaining way, bringing out the multifaceted character of both the author and the title personage, personage in a manner not unlike what readers of novels might expect. It tells a tale of adventure in the raw Siberian wilds where even sex and violence make an occasional appearance, though with a connection to the plot line quite unlike their counterparts in any work of fiction I have read. Secondly, the book gives the impression of a documentary account of real-life events, even if one's powers of belief are sometimes stretched to the limit. I am glad that my linguistic experience has given me access not only to the book itself, but also to a host of Russian language texts on the internet that have enabled me to corroborate from independent sources a great many of the specifics the author saw fit to include in his narrative. Names of individuals, institutions, scientific phenomena, etc., all of which turned out to be genuine, thereby contributing an additional measure of credence to what otherwise might seem utterly fantastic. Much of the corroborative information so gleaned I have attempted to pass on to the English speaker reader in the footnotes with the help of additional commentary by the publisher. And yet there is a significant area of author's description where authenticity must still be judged by the individual reader, which to me is one of the hallmarks of a work of literature in contrast to a merely academic or journalistic report. Thirdly, the book penetrates one's thinking and feelings with the gentle force of a divinely inspired treatise, a treatise on not only the meaning of human life, but much more. Anastasia offers a tremendous new insight into the whole interrelationship of God, man, nature, and the universe. I would even go so far as to call it a revelation in science and religion. One nutshell description that comes to mind is a chronicle of ideas. Ideas on A, the history of humanity's relationship to everything outside itself. B, the clouds, not only dark and foreboding, but even the fluffy and attractive variety of mistaken belief that have, over the years, hid this relationship from our sight and comprehension. And C, where to begin. Once we have caught a glimpse of this relationship, the necessary journey to reclaiming the whole picture. Deeply metaphysical in essence, the chronicle is set forth with both the supporting evidence of a documentary account and the entertainment capacity of a novel. In other words, it can be read as any of these three in isolation, but only by taking the three dimensions together will the reader have something approaching a complete picture of the book? And all three are infused with a degree of soul-felt inspiration that can only be expressed in poetry. Yes, indeed, one must not overlook the poetry. As a matter of fact, I learned right at the start that experience in poetic translation was one of the qualifications required of a Ringing Cedar series translator. And not just on account of the seven sample poems by readers at the end of chapter 30. Much of the book's prose, especially when Anastasia is speaking, exudes a poetic feel with rhyme and meter running a background course through a whole paragraph at a time. Hence, a particular challenge lay in reproducing this poetic quality along with a semantic meaning in English translation. 
such poetic prose is even more evident in subsequent books in the series. Another challenge has been to match as closely as possible Vladimir Megre's progressive development as a writer. According to his own admission, Megre began this whole literary project not as a professional writer, but as a hardened entrepreneur for whom writing was the farthest activity from his mind. I smiled when one of the test readers of the translation, after finishing the first few chapters, described the author's style as choppy. Megre himself talks about the initial rejection notices he received from the publisher after, publish, after publisher, telling him his language was too stilted. And yet his rendering of some of Anastasia's pronouncements towards the end of book one waxes quite lyrical indeed especially in the poetic passages referred to above. The author's development in literary style, which he attributes to Anastasia's direct and indirect guidance, becomes even more pronounced as the series progresses. It will be up to the English speaker, speaking reader to judge whether this transformation is also conveyed in the translation. There were two Russian words of frequent occurrence throughout the book, that presented a particular translation challenge. One of them was dashnik, plural of dashnik, referring to people who own a dasha or a country cottage situated on just 600 square meters of land obtainable free of charge from the Russian government. But there is little comparison here to most Western concept, concepts of cottages. While Russian dashas may be found in forested areas or simply on open farmland, one almost invariable feature is a plot, usha stock, on which are grown fruits and vegetables to supply the family not only for their dasha stays but right throughout the year. Given that the word dasha is already known to many English speakers, and is included in popular editions of both Oxford and Webster, it was decided to use the Russian word designated its designating its occupants as well, with the English plural ending dashniks. The question that entailed the most serious difficulty, however, one that formed the subject of several dozen emails between publisher and translator before it was finally resolved, was the rendering into the English of the Russian word shelovik. It is the common term used to denote a person or a human being, the equivalent German of mensch, as well as the English man. In the familiar Bible verse, God created man in his own image. The problem with the term human, as in human being, is that it not only suggests a formation of the species from matter or earth, compare humus, the organic constitute of soil, but is associated with lowly concepts from humus, humus comes words like humble, humility, etc. Whereas shelovik is derived from the old Russian words indicated thinking, shelo, lob, and time, vik and an expression of man's dominion over time by virtue of God-bestowed capacity for thinking and reason, not unlike the significance of man in the Bible verse cited above. The problem with the word man is that, especially in our age, it has become so closely associated with only half of the total number of sentient thinking beings on the planet that the other half, quite understandably, feels collectively excluded by the term Russian, by contrast, does not have this problem. Shelovik can designate either a man or a woman. In the end, partly through reason and partly through revelation, it was decided to translate Shelovik wherever appropriate to the context by the term man with a capital M in an effort to ret retain the association of the term with the divine as opposed to a material, earthly origin, as well as to show the link between Anastasia's view of man, Shelovek, and the concept of man in the first chapter of Genesis, which she freely quotes herself. So let all readers of this book 
be put on notice. Whenever you see man with a capital M, this includes you. There are other discrepancies between Russian and English concepts behind respective translation equivalents, but their explanation is best left to individual footnotes. In conclusion, I must express my gratitude to my editor, Leonid Sharashkin of Ringing Cedars Press, first for entrusting me with the privileged task of translating such a monumental work as the Ringing Cedars series, and secondly, for the tremendous support he has given me throughout this initial project, namely in illuminating aspects of Vladimir Migre's and Anastasia's concepts of God, man, nature, and the universe, that my previous experience with Russian literature could not possibly have prepared me for. These shared insights have made a significant difference in how particular nuances of the original are rendered in the translation and especially in making allowances for the considerable geographical, social and philosophical distances that all too often separate English-speaking readers from the vast cultural treasures accessible to those with the knowledge of Russian. I now invite you all to take your seats in the familiar exploration vehicle known as the English language as we journey together to examine a previously inaccessible Russian treasure of momentous significance for all humanity, including the planet we collectively inhabit, an experience summed up in one beautiful word, Anastasia. Ottawa, Canada, January 2005, John Woodsworth. Anastasia. Chapter One. The Ringing Cedar. In the spring of 1994, I chartered three river boats on which I carried out a three month expedition on the River Ob in Siberia from Novosibirsk to Salakhard and back. The aim of the expedition was to foster economic ties with the regions of the Russian far north. The expedition went under the name of the Merchant Convoy. The largest of the three river boats was a passenger ship named the Patrice Lamomba. Western Siberian river boats bear rather interesting names, the Maria Yulianova, the Patrice Lamomba, the Mikhail Kalinin, as if there were no other personages in history worth commemorating. The lead ship, Patrice Lamomba, housed the expedition headquarters, along with a store where local Siberian entrepreneurs could exhibit their wares. The plan was for the convoy to travel north 3,500 kilometres, visiting not only major ports of call such as Tomsk, Nizhnevartovsk, Khantimanysk and Salekhard, but smaller places as well where goods could be unloaded only during a brief summer navigation season. The convoy would dock at a populated settlement during the day time. We would offer the wares we had brought for sale and hold talks about setting up regular economic links. Our travelling was usually done at night. If weather conditions were unfavourable for navigation, the lead ship would put into the nearest port and we would organise onboard parties for the local young people. Most places offered little in the way of their own entertainment. Clubs and community centres so-called houses of culture, had been going downhill ever since the collapse of the USSR and there were almost no cultural activities available. Sometimes we might go for 24 hours or more without seeing a single populated place, even the tiniest village. From the river, the only transportation artery for many kilometres around, the only thing visible to the eye was the tiger itself. It was not yet aware, I was not yet aware at the time that somewhere amidst the uninhabited vastness of forest along the riverbank, a surprise meeting was awaiting me. 
one that was to change my whole life. One day, on our way back to Novosibirsk, I arranged to dock the lead ship at a small village, one with only a few houses at best, some 30 or 40 kilometres distant from the larger population centres. I planned a three-hour stopover so the crew could have sh shore leave and the local residents could buy some of our goods and foodstuffs and we could cheaply pick up from them fish and wild-growing plants of the taiga. During our stopover time, as the leader of the expedition, I was approached by two of the local senior citizens, as I judged at the time. One of them appeared to be somewhat older than the other, the elder of the two, a wizened fellow with a long grey beard, kept silent the whole time, leaving his younger companion to do the talking. This fellow tried to persuade me to lend him 50 of my crew, which numbered no more than 65 in total, to go with them into the taiga after uh, about 25 kilometres or so from the dock where the ship was berthed. They would be taken into the depths of the taiga to cut down a tree he described as a ringing cedar. The cedar, which he said reached 40 metres in height, needed to be cut up into pieces which could be carried by hand to the ship. We must, he said, definitely take the whole lot. The only fellow further the other older fellow further recommended that each piece be cut up into smaller pieces. Each of us should keep one for himself and give the rest to relatives, friends and anyone who wished to accept a piece as a gift. He said this was a most unusual cedar. The piece should be worn on one's chest as a pendant. Hang it around your neck while standing barefoot on the grass and then press it into your chest with the palm of your left hand. It takes only a moment to feel the pleasing warmth emanating from the piece of cedar, followed by a light tingling sensation running through the body. From time to time, whenever desired, the side of the pendant facing away from the body should be rubbed with one one's fingers, the thumb pressed against the other side. The old fellow confidently assured me that within three months of the, the possessor of one of these ringing cedar pendants will feel significant improvement in his sense of well-being and will be cured of many diseases. Even AIDS, I asked and briefly explained what I had learnt about this disease from the press. The oldster confidently replied, from any and all diseases. But this, he considered, was an easy task. The main benefit was that anyone having one of these pendants would become kinder, more successful, and more talented. I did know a little bit about the healing properties of the cedars of our Siberian taiga, but the suggestion that it could affect one's feelings and abilities, well, that to me seemed beyond the bounds of probability. The thought came to me that maybe these old men wanted money from me for this unusual cedar, as they themselves called it. And I began explaining that out in the big wide world, women were used to wearing jewellery made of gold and silver and wouldn't pay a dime for, for some scrap of wood and so I wouldn't, wasn't going to lay out any money for anything like that. They don't know what they're wearing, came the reply. Gold? Well, that's dust in comparison with one of this cedar. But we don't need any money for it. We can give you some dried mushrooms in addition, but there's nothing we need from you. Not to wanting to start an argument out of respect for their age, I said, well... Maybe someone will wear some of your sea dependents. They certainly would if a uh, top wood carving craftsman agreed to put his hand to it and create something of amazing beauty, to which the old fellow replied, yes, you could carve it, but it would be better to polish it by rubbing. It would be a lot better if you do it yourself, with your fingers, whenever your heart desires. Then the cedar will also have a beautiful look to it. 
Then the younger of the two quickly unbuttoned first his old worn jacket and then his shirt and revealed that he was wearing on his chest. I looked and saw a puffed out circle or oval. It was multicolored, purple, raspberry, auburn, forming some kind of puzzling design. The vein lines on the wood looked like little streams. I am not a connoisseur of objets d'art, although from time to time I have had occasion to visit picture galleries. The world's great masters had not called forth any particular emotions in me, but the object hanging around this man's neck aroused significantly greater feelings and emotions than any of my visits to the Tretriakov gallery. How many years have you been rubbing this piece of cedar? I asked. Ninety-three, the old fellow responded. And how old are you? A hundred and nineteen. At the time, I didn't believe him. He looked like a man of seventy-five. Either he hadn't noticed my doubts, or if he had, he paid no attention to them. In somewhat excited tones, he started in trying to persuade me that any piece of this cedar, polished by human fingers alone, would also look beautiful in just three years. Then it would start looking even better and better, especially when worn by a woman. The body of its wearer would give off a pleasant and beneficial aroma, quite unlike anything artificially produced by man. Indeed, a very pleasant fragrance was emanating from both these old men. I could feel it. Even though I'm a smoker, and like all smokers, I have a dulled sense of smell. And there was one other peculiarity. I suddenly became aware of phrases in the speech of these strangers that were not common to the residents of this isolated part of the north. Some of them, I remember to this day, even the intonations associated with them. Here is what the old fellow told me. God created the cedar to store cosmic energy. When someone is in a state of love, they emit a radiant energy. It takes but a second for it to reflect off the celestial bodies floating overhead and come back to earth and give life to everything that breathes. The sun is one of those celestial bodies, and it reflects but a tiny fraction of such radiance. Only bright rays can travel into space from man on the earth, and only beneficial rays can be reflected back from space, back to earth. Under the influence of malicious feelings, man can emit only dark rays. These dark rays cannot rise but must fall into the depths of the earth. Bouncing off its core, they return to the surface in the form of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, wars, etc. The culminating achievements of these dark rays is their direct effect on the man originating them, invariably exacerbating this man's own malicious feelings. Cedars live to be 550 years old. Day and night, their millions of needles catch and store the whole spectrum of bright energy. During the period of the cedar's life, all the celestial bodies pass above them, reflecting this bright energy. Even in one tiny piece of cedar, there is more energy beneficial to man than in all the man-made energy installations taken together. Cedars receive the energy emanating from man through space. Store it up and at the right moment, give it back. They give it back when there is not enough of it in space. In other words, in man or in everything living and growing on the earth. Occasionally, though, very rarely, one discovers cedars that have been storing up energy but not giving back what they have stored. After 500 years of their life, they start to ring. This is how they talk to us, through their quiet ringing sound. This is how they signal people to take them and saw them up to make use of their stored up energy on the earth. This is what the cedars are asking with their ringing sound. They keep us 
They keep on asking for three whole years. If they don't have contact with living human beings, then in three years, deprived of the opportunity to give back what they have received and stored from space, they lose their ability to give it back directly to man. Then they will start burning up the energy internally. This tortuous process of burning and dying lasts 27 years. Not long ago, we discovered a cedar like this. We determined that it had been ringing for two years already. It was ringing very softly. Perhaps it is trying to draw out its request over a longer period of time, but still it has only one year left. It must be sawed up and given away to people. The old man spoke at length, and for some reason I heard him out. The voice of this strange old Sibriak sounded at first quietly confident and then very excited, and when he got excited he would rub the piece of cedar with his fingertips as though they were lightly tripping over some kind of musical instrument. It was cold on the river bank. An autumn wind was blowing across the river. Gusts of wind ruffled the hair on the old men's capless heads. But the smoke spokesman's jacket and shirt remained unbuttoned. His fingertips kept rubbing the cedar pendant on his chest, still exposed to the wind. He was still trying to explain its significance to me. Lydia Petrovna an employee of my firm came down the gangplank to tell me that everyone else was already on board and waiting for me to finish my conversation. I bade farewell to the oldsters and quickly climbed aboard. I couldn't act on their request for two reasons. Delaying departure, especially for three days, would mean a significant financial loss. And besides, everything these fellow old fellows said seemed to me at the time to be in the realm of pure superstition. The next morning, during our usual company meeting, I suddenly noticed that Lydia Petrovna was fingering a seed pendant of her own. Later, she would tell me that after I'd gone on board, she stayed behind for a while. She noticed that when I started hurrying away from them, the oldster that had been talking with me stared after me with a perplexed look and then said excitedly to his older companion, Now, how can that be? Why didn't they get it? I really don't know how to speak their language. I couldn't make them believe. I simply couldn't. Why? Tell me, father. The elder man put his hand on his son's shoulder and replied, You weren't convincing enough, son. They didn't grasp it. As I was going up the gangplank, Lydia Petrovna went on, the old man was talking with you suddenly rushed up to me grabbed me by the arm and led me back down to the grass below. He hurriedly pulled out of his pocket a string and attached to it was this piece of cedar wood. He put it around my neck and pressed it against my chest with the palm of both his hand and mine. I even felt a shiver go through my whole body. Somehow he managed to do all of this very quickly and I didn't even get a chance to say anything to him. As I was walking away, he called after me. Have a safe journey. Be happy. Please come again next year. All the best, people. We'll be waiting for you. Have a safe journey. As the ship pulled away from the dock, the old fellow kept on waving at us for a long time and then all at once sat down on the grass. I was watching him through a pair of binoculars. The old man that talked with you and later gave me the pendant I saw him sit down on the grass and his shoulders were trembling. The older one with the long beard was bending over him and stroking his head. Amidst the flurry of my subsequent commercial dealings, account keeping and end of voyage farewell banquets, I completely forgot about the strange Siberian oldsters. Upon my return to Novosibirsk, I was afflicted with sharp pains. The diagnosis, a duodenal intestinal ulcer and osteochondrosis of the thoracic spine. 
In the quiet of the comfy hospital ward, I was cut off from the bustle of everyday life. My deluxe private room gave me an opportunity to calmly reflect on my four-month expedition and to draw up a business plan for the future. But it seemed as though my memory relegated just about everything that had happened to the background, and for some reason the old men and what they said came to the forefront of my thought. I requ requested to have delivered to me in the hospital all sorts of literature on cedars. After comparing what I read with what I had heard, I became more and more amazed and began to actually believe what the oldsters had said. There was at least some kind of truth in their words, or maybe the whole thing was true. In books on folk medicine, there is a lot said about the cedar as a healing remedy. They say that everything from the tips of the needles to the bark is endowed with highly effective healing properties. The Siberian cedar wood has a beautiful appearance and artistic wood carving masters enjoy great success in using it for furniture as well as sound boards for musical instruments. Cedar needles are highly capable of contamin decontaminating the surrounding air. Cedar wood has a distinctive pleasant balsam fragrance. A small cedar chip placed inside a house will keep moths away. In the popular science literature, I read it was said that the qualitative characteristics for the northern cedars was, was significantly higher than those from the growing in the south. Back in 1792, the academician P.S. Pallas wrote that the fruits of the Siberian cedar were effective in restoring youth and virility and significantly increasing the body's ability to withstand a number of diseases. There is a whole host of historical phenomena directly or indirectly linked to the Siberian cedar. Here is one of them. In 1907, a 50-year-old semi-literate peasant named Gregory Rasputin, who hailed from an isolated Siberian village in an area where the Siberian cedar grows, found himself in St. Petersburg, the capital, and soon became a regular guest of the imperial family. Not only did he amaze them with his predictions, but he possessed incredible sexual stamina. At the time of his assassination, onlookers were struck by the fact that despite his bullet-ridden body, he continued to live. Perhaps because he had been raised on cedar nuts, in a part of the country where cedars abound? This is how a contemporary journalist described his staying power. At age 50, he could begin an orgy at noon and go on carousing until four o'clock in the morning. From his fornication and drunkenness, he would go directly to the church for morning prayers and stand praying until eight before heading home for a cup of tea. Then, as if nothing had happened, he would carry on receiving visitors until two in the afternoon. Next, he would collect a group of ladies and accompany them to the baths. From the baths, he would be off to a restaurant in the country where he would begin repeating the previous night's activities. No normal person would ever keep up a regime like that. The many-time world champion and Olympic champion wrestler Alexander Karolin, who has never been defeated so far, is also a Siberian, also from an area where the Siberian cedar grows. This strong man also eats cedar nuts. A coincidence? I mentioned only those facts which can be easily verified in popular science literature or which can be confirmed by witnesses. Lydia Petrovna, who was giving given the ringing seed pendant by the Siberian oldster, is now one of those witnesses. She is 36 years old, married with two children. Her co-workers have noticed changes in her behaviour. She has become kinder and smiles more often. Her husband, whom I happen to know, told me that their family has now been experiencing a greater degree of mutual understanding. 
He also remarked that his wife has somehow become younger looking and is starting to arouse greater feelings in him, more respect and quite possibly more love. But all these multitudinous facts and evidences pale in comparison to the main point, which you can look up for yourself, a discovery which has left me with no, not a trace of doubt, and that is the Bible. In the book of Leviticus, in the Old Testament, chapter 14, verse 4, God teaches us how to treat people and even decontaminate their houses with the help of the cedar. After comparing all the facts and data I had gleaned from various sources, I was confronted by such a remarkable picture that all the miracles known to the world faded before it. The great mysteries that have excited people's minds began to pale in, into in, insignificance in comparison with the mystery of the ringing cedar. Now I could no longer have any doubts about its existence. They were all dispelled by the popular science literature and the old Vedic scriptures I was reading. Cedars are mentioned 42 times in the Bible, all in the Old Testament. When Moses presented humanity with the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, he probably knew more than has been recorded in the Old Testament. We are accustomed to the fact that in nature there are various plants capable of treating human ills. The healing properties of the cedar have been attested in popular science literature by such serious and authoritative researchers as Academician Pallas, and this is consistent with the Old Testament scriptures. And now pay very careful attention. When the Old Testament talks about the cedar, it is just the cedar alone. Nothing is said about other trees. And doesn't the Old Testament say that the cedar is the most potent medicine of any existing in nature? What is this anyway? A medicine kit? And how is it to be used? And why, out of all the Siberian cedars, did these strange old fellows point to a single ringing cedar? But that's not all. Something immeasurably more mysterious lies beyond this story from the Old Testament. King Solomon built a temple out of cedar wood. In return for the cedar from Lebanon, he gave another king, Hiram, 20 cities of his kingdom. Incredible. Giving away 20 cities just for some kind of building materials. True, he got something else in return. At King Solomon's request, he was given servants that were skilled in felling timber. What kind of people were these? What knowledge did they possess? I have heard that even now, in the far-flung reaches of the Taiga, there are old people whose job it is to choose trees for construction. But back then, over 2,000 years ago, everybody might have known this. Nevertheless, specialists of some sort were required. The temple was built. Services began to be held there, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. What kind of cloud was that? How and from where did it enter the temple? What could it have been? Energy? Spirit? kind of phenomena, and what connection did it have with the cedar? The old fellows talked about the ringing cedar as storing up some kind of energy. Which cedars are stronger, the ones in Lebanon or Siberia? Academic Palace said that the healing properties of the cedars increased in proportion to their proximity to the forest tundra. In that case, then the Siberian cedar, cedar would be stronger. It said in the Bible, by their fruits ye shall be, you shall know them. 
In other words, again, the Siberian cedar. By their fruits ye shall know them. Could it be that no one has paid any attention to this? Has no one put two and two together? The Old Testament, the science of the past century and the current one are all of the same opinion regarding the cedar. And Elena Ivanova Rorich notes in her book, Living Ethics, a chalice of cedar resin figured in the rituals of the consecration of the kings of the ancient Khorasan. Druids also called chalice of cedar resin the chalice of life. And only later, with the loss of the realization of the spirit, was it replaced by blood. The fire of Zoroaster was the result of burning of the cedar resin in the chalice. So then, how much of our forebear's knowledge of the cedar, its properties and uses, has been passed down to the present day? Is it possible that nothing has been preserved? What do the Siberian oldsters know about it? And all at once my memory harked back to an experience of many years ago which caused a shiver to run up and down my spine. I didn't pay attention to it back then, but now, during the early years of, of Perestroika, I was president of the Association of Siberian Entrepreneurs. One day, I got a call from Novosibirsk District Executive Council. Back then, we still had Communist Party committees and executive councils, asking me to come to a meeting with a prominent Western businessman. He had a letter for, of recommendation for the government of the day. Several entrepreneurs were present, along with workers from the Executive Council Secretariat. The Western businessman was of a rather imposing external appearance. An unusual person with oriental features. He was wearing a turban. And his fingers were adorned with precious rings. The discussion, as usual, centred around the possibilities for cooperation in various fields. The visitor said, among other things, we would like to buy cedar nuts from you. As he spoke these words, his face and body tightened and his sharp eyes moved from side to side, no doubt studying the reaction of the entrepreneurs present. I remember the incident very well, as even then I wondered why his appearance had changed like that. After the official meeting, the Moscow interpreter accompanying him came up to me. She said he would like to speak with me. The businessman made me a confidential proposal. If I could arrange delivery of cedar nuts for him, and they had to be fresh, then I would receive a handsome personal percentage over and above the official price. The nuts were to be shipped to Turkey for processing into some kind of oil. I said I would think it over. I decided I would find out for myself what kind of oil he was talking about, and I did. On the London market, which sets the standard for world prices, cedar nut oil fetches anywhere up to $500 per kilogram. Their proposal deal, proposed deal would have given us approximately 2 to $3 per one kilogram of cedar nuts. I rang up an entrepreneur I happened to know in Warsaw and asked him whether it might be possible to market such a product directly to the consumer and whether we could learn the technology involved in its extraction. A month later, he sent me a reply. No way. We weren't able to ac gain access to the technology. And besides, there's a certain Western powers so involved in these issues of yours that it would be better just to forget about it. After that, I turned to my good friend, Konstantin Ruk Rukanov, a scholar, with our Novosibirsk Consumer Cooperative Institute. I bought a shipment of nuts and financed a study. And the laboratories of his institute produced approximately 
100 kilograms of cedar nut oil. I also hired researchers who came up with the following information from archival documents. Before the revolution, and even for some time afterward, there was in Siberia an organization known as the Siberian Cooperator. People from this organization traded in oil, including cedar nut oil. They had rather swanky branches, branch offices in Harbin, London, and New York, and rather large Western bank accounts. After the revolution, the organization eventually collapsed and many of its members went abroad. A member of the Bolshevist government, Leonid Krasin, met with the head of this organization and asked him to return to Russia. But the head of the Siberian Cooperator replied that he would be able would be of more help to Russia if he remained outside its borders. From archival materials, I further learnt that cedar oil was made using wooden, only wooden, presses in many villages of the Siberian taiga. The quality of the cedar oil depended on the season in which the nuts were gathered and how they were processed. But... I was unable to determine either from the archives or the institute exactly which season was being indicated. The secret had been lost. There are no healing remedies with properties analogous to those of cedar oil, but perhaps the secret of making this oil had been passed along by one of the emigres to someone in the West. How was it possible that the cedar nuts with the most effective healing properties of grow in Siberia, and yet the facility for producing the oil is located in Turkey. After all, Turkey has no cedars like those found in Siberia. And just what Western powers was the Warsaw entrepreneur talking about? Why did he say it would be better just to forget about this issue? Might not these powers be smuggling this product? with its extraordinary healing properties out of our Russia-Siberian taiga? Why, with such a treasure here at home, with such effective properties, a treasure known for centuries, for millennia even, do we spend millions and maybe billions of dollars buying up foreign medicines and swallow them up like half-crazed people? How is it that we have lost the knowledge known to our forebears, our recent forebears yet, ones who lived in our century, and what about the Bible's description of that extraordinary happening of over 2,000 years ago? What kind of unknown powers are trying to earnestly to erase our forebears' knowledge from our own memories? Oh, you'd better stick to minding your own business, we're told. Yes, they are trying to wipe it out, and indeed they are succeeding. I was seized by a fit of anger. I checked and yes, cedar oil is gold in our pharmacies, but it is sold in foreign packaging. I bought a single 30-gram vial and tried it. The actual oil content, I think, was no more than a couple of drops. The rest was some kind of diluting agent. Compared to what was produced in the Consumer Cooperative Institute, well, there was simply no comparison. And these diluted couple of drops cost 50,000 rubles. So what if we didn't buy it abroad, but sold it ourselves? Just the sale of this oil would be enough to raise the whole of Siberia above the poverty level. But how did we ever manage to let go of the technology of our forebears? And here we are, sniveling, that we live like paupers. Well, okay, I think I'll come up with something all the same. I'll produce the oil myself, and my firm will only get wealthier. I decided I would try a second expedition along the Ob, back up north, using only my headquarters ships, the Patrice Lamumba. I loaded a variety of goods for sale into the hold and turned the film viewing room into a store. I decided to hire a new crew and not invite anyone from my firm as things stood, my firm's financial situation had worsened while I was distracted but with my new interest. 
Two weeks after leaving Novoserbisk, my security guards reported they had overheard conversations about the ringing cedar. And in their opinion, the newly hired workers included some pretty strange people, to put it mildly, began summoning individual crew members to my quarters to talk about the forthcoming trek into the taiga. Some of them even agreed to go on a voluntary basis. Others asked for extra pay for this operation, since it was not something they had agreed to when signing up for work. It was one thing to stay in the comfortable conditions aboard ship, quite another to trek 25 kilometres into the taiga and back, carrying loads of wood. My finances at the time were already pretty tight. I had not planned on selling the cedar. After all, the oldsters had said it should be given away. Besides, my main interest was not the cedar itself, but the secret of how to extract the oil. And of course, it would be fascinating to find out all the details connected with it. Little by little, with the help of my security guards, I realized that there would be attempts made to spy on my movements, especially after I left the ship. But for what purpose was unclear? And who was behind the would-be spies? I thought and thought about it and decided that to be absolutely certain, I would somehow have to outsmart everyone at once. End of chapter one.